right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. So here's Jacques, Paul Jacques Griot, who was an architect. He, one of the early books that I read, you know, showing architecture and architectural design connected with geometry. And as he says here, the world around us is a world of numbers, numbers that spell life and harmony. They are organized by the geometry of figures, all related to one another according to a sublime order into dynamic symmetry. Glimpses into this magnificent kingdom form the basis of all our knowledge, and it seems that in this domain, the ancient civilizations had gone further than modern science. Uh -huh. It's really a, a, a kind of a, a um, radical thing to say back in 1960. Yeah. Well, we talk about it on the podcast all the time, that ancient civilizations have gone further than modern science in some aspects, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's an old Masonic lecture that's quite beautiful. I'll, I'll quote a little bit out of it. Okay. And this is sort of in the, um, you know, it's in the public domain, I think, so I'm not um, <laughs> breaking any vows or anything here. If this is probably going back to the 1700s even. If we consider the symmetry and order which govern all the works of creation, we must admit that geometry pervades the universe. The ancient philosophers placed such a high estimate upon this science that all who frequented the groves of the sacred academy were compelled to explore its heavenly paths, and no one whose mind was unexpanded by its precepts was entrusted with the instruction of the young. By geometry, we may curiously trace nature through her various windings to her most concealed recesses. By it, we discover how the planets move in their respective orbits and demonstrate their various revolutions. By it, we account for the return of the seasons and the variety of the scenes which each season displays to the discerning eye. By it, we discover the power, wisdom, and goodness of the grand artificer of the universe and view with delight the proportions which connect the vast machine, numberless worlds around us, all framed by the same divine artist, which roll through the vast expanse and are all governed by the same unerring law of nature. And then we have an inscription uh, from an ancient second century Chinese tomb, which gets us a little more specific into the, um, into the, uh, the ideas of geometry. He who understands the earth is a wise man, and he who understands the heavens is a sage. Knowledge is derived from the straight line shadow, and that is derived from the right angled joint. The combination of the right angle with numbers is what guides and rules the 10,000 things. And this is from Keith Critchlow's work, Time Stands Still. Highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in this kind of subject matter. These are Borneo tribesmen here. They've set that stick into the ground, which then casts a shadow and makes a right angled joint. Uh -huh. And from that, from that simple stick in the ground, they can essentially measure the heavens. They can measure the, the, the span of the year. Um, they can lay out a magnificent geometric template upon the surface of the ground. I'm not sure exactly what these fellas are doing here, but they are definitely tracking the shadow cast by this vertical pole or stick set into the ground, which is basically serving the same function as, a, for example, an obelisk in Egypt. You see, when you have an obelisk with a sharp point at the top, that means the shadow has a sharp point. And through the course of the day, that shadow swings in a great arc around. It not only is swinging around, um, but it's also uh, first shortening and then growing again in length. So 
if you draw, if you have a, a pole in the ground and you draw a circle around it and you begin to track the shadow, you know, as the sun rises, the, sh the shadow shortens. Early in the morning, the shadows of anything will be long, won't they? Right. At noon, at high noon, the shadow will be the shortest that it is in the day. And then as the sun proceeds into the west and gets lower in the sky, uh -oh. the shadow grows to the east, right? And the shadows at the end, as you get towards dusk, they get longer and longer until eventually they would become theoretically infinite in length. But what they have done is they've traced out a geometry on the ground that can be, that can be mapped. And then from that geometry, you can determine the cardinal directions and you can lay out whatever geometric template you want. So the, 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 when the architects of old were going to build, the first thing they did after they had um, identified the omphalos or the naval center of the temple, which was uh, allegorically the navel of the world, the uh, omphalos was the Greek word that meant navel. They would, and usually there would be uh, somebody who had a skill, a divining skill or some type of uh, extra sensory ability who would determine where the sacred center was, the omphalos. And then through an act of acupuncture, once that omphalos, which was uh, found at the intersection of the Earth's meridian lines, the acupuncture needle or the pole uh, or the staff would be inserted into that point. And then through tracking the shadows, the temple would be laid out, the, the, the template, Notice the, the, the word temple and template, you hmm. see. Also notice the similarity of the word temporal, which means time, right? Ah. Because the temple was based on a tem template, was an image of time frozen. Ha. Huh. Man, yeah. we've given, we've given uh, archaeologists so much flack for calling everything that they find a temple <laughs> or a tomb. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I guess we can't. We have to strike temple from that one because that's – I never never put that together. That's, that's great. That's awesome. Well, yeah, so that's, that was kind of the idea behind the, the temple. And, and it just any old building couldn't be a temple, obviously. It had to uh, conform to certain principles. For, for what? The first thing I said was the, 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 the identification of the omphalos. And then from there, and, and see, here's the other thing to bear in mind, guys. When you put that pole in the earth and you start creating templates from the shadows, they're all going to vary depending on your latitude. So right. the geometry that's generated, you know, at 23 and a half degrees north is not going to be the same as that generated from 45 degrees north. And so you get a template that is attuned to that particular place on the earth. Right. Uh, so I have a question about the pole real quick. I'm just looking at this picture you've got here and Kyle and I are builders and we've done a lot of surveying. And so you have to make sure that pole is like actually vertical. So did they have a way of doing that where the, to make sure that it was actually perfectly? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they do. And I, I, I'm not sure how these fellows here would have done that. Yeah. Of course I do it with a plumb bob. Right. Plumb bob is what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I would do it. I do it with the plumb bob. Yeah, it, it's basically imagine that you set up a um, something that looks like the Greek letter pi. Um, so you've got two verticals and a horizontal, and you essentially hang a plumb bob from the horizontal. Right. Is 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 how it it was actually done. I don't know how they how they're plumbing this particular staff. So you can you can measure at the bay, at where the plumb bob is if it's closer to one pole or the other, and then you can stand in line with the two poles to see if the plumb bob is is sticking out. Yeah, on either side, and that would give you your two axes. Mm. Mm -hmm. We need to sell that that transit. <laughs> Just get a plumb bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, to me, it's fun to to. to Combine, you know, modern technolo technology with some ancient techniques. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. That, you, I mean, that's a lot of fun. You uh, were telling us, so you're talking about that, you know, you put the pole on the ground, you make sure that it's absolutely vertical using a plumb bob or whatever your technique is. And then you draw the circle around the pole. And, the, and so the pole has to be at the exact center of that circle you draw. 
And then yes. you mark you mark where the shadow crosses the the line when the tip of the shadow comes in and crosses the line. You mark that spot, and then you wait for the other side. You know, then you yeah. wait. For Here, here's what you do: you got a picture, you got that pole, and you draw a circle around it, a fairly large circle, right? Okay. Yeah. Depends on the height of the pole. I mean, you could actually do this on a really small scale. You could have a. I, in fact, when I was teaching classes to geometry classes to kids a decade or two ago. I would sometimes I would just have a piece of plywood with a with a um, with a dowel stuck in it. Ah. You take that outside and you know have a circle around. So you can you can do it on a really small scale. Obviously, if you do it on a larger scale, you're going to get greater accuracy. And if you're going to actually build a, a, a structure, you would want to get it pretty accurate. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw a circle, and this would be done um, by using a rope or a a chain, oftentimes you might have a chain with a round link on the end, and you would slide that over the pole, right? Uh -huh. And each link in the chain would be a specified length, and you pull the chain out, and, and by knowing the number, counting the number of links, you could then determine a radius, which is actually a more accurate way than, than doing a knotted rope, which, yeah. which would also work. But, but I like the chain method because you know, where each link is very uniform. Right. Um, so then you draw your circle. Okay, so now the sun is rising, and it's rising in the east, so your shadow is going to point to the west, and it's going to be really long. Now, as the sun's rising up, the shadow is shortening. At the same time, it's swinging around. So somewhere, depending on the, the, the relationship between the length of the pole and the radius of the circle, somewhere – you, you want to set it up so somewhere around maybe mid-morning or even a little earlier, the point of the shadow will intersect the circle. And when it does, at that point of intersection, you'd drive a stake. Now you'd wait, and then as the sun shifts over to the west, the shadow is now pointing to the east. And as the sun is going setting, the shadow is getting longer. Sometime during late afternoon, the point of the shadow is now going to touch the circle again. You draw the second, drive the second stake there. Now, and, and I've done this. Okay, so now you drive a stake in each one. Yeah. I would probably take a small nail and put in the top of each stake. And then you take a piece of Mason's line, tie it off on one stake, stretch it to the other one, tie it off. And that pretty much will give you a very accurate east-west line. <laughs> That's freaking awesome. Yes. <laughs> How do they figure this out? Like, I, okay, <laughs> I have a question about that. Like, so you've got, you've got the height of, your, of the pole and then, and then the, the radius of the circle. That's going to determine the difference in time between the point intersecting one side, the eastern side and the western side. Yeah. But is there, is there a, a way to make the ratio such that it's, say you know, eight hours or to, to know, you see what oh, I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you could work all that out, but you don't really almost need to. It's more an empirical process than a theoretical process. You know, obviously if your circle is too big, it's going to be awkward. If it's too small, you know, like in this case, if you're looking back at the two Borneo tribesmen, you would want your circle to be three or four times you know, its radius to be at least three or four times the length of the pole. Okay. Okay. See, um, and cause, because the bigger the circle, the, the higher the resolution of your yes. east -west line, basically. Yes. Okay. I'm wondering, cause, cause like the, the, the pyramid, like the great pyramid, there's something about the, you know, the, the 52 degree angle on the sides and then the height of the pyramid relationship to the circumference of the circle is is the is the pi relationship isn't that right i think so yeah so i wonder if there if if you take that relationship what is the time difference or so you see what i'm saying i was just curious like if there's a that would be interesting okay. well at th that time difference is going to be um you know based upon the ratio between the length of the pole and the radius of the circle. And what you don't want to do is obviously um, if you try to do it too early, the shadow is going to be too damn long. You know, you don't want to have to go out, you know, 600 or 800 feet, you know, and have a circle that big. <laughs> yeah. You want to have a circle that's, 
you know, 20 or 30 feet in diameter might be a typical good working size, right? And then what's going to happen is, so you don't want to be too early in the morning because that's impractical. And then if you wait too long, as you get towards noon, now um, the shadow gets too short. And what's happening there is, is now that the, the, where you're going to, the two points of intersection are going to be so close. They're going to be, the closer you get to noon, the closer those two points are going to be to each other, you see? Right. Yeah. And then your right? accuracy goes down again. And your accuracy goes down. So you want to have enough. And obviously this is going to be relative to the scale of the, of what you're trying to do with it. Let's say yeah. if you're going to build a house or a temple, whatever, a building that's going to be, um, you know, uh, let's do, let's just say a, a normal size house or building in that scale. Well, then, using a six foot pole like these Borneo tribesmen are doing, you would probably want to have a circle, like I said, between 20 and 30 feet. And then yeah. that would give you enough accuracy that you would, you know, you drive your two stakes, you run your line, and now that gives you an east-west axis. Now, you can use that as the axis of your building or not. Because once you've got that, that establishment line, once you've generated that line, the line you could actually you would call it a generatrix because from that you could do a second line that would be parallel to it so any line that's parallel to that first generatrix is also going to be east west and through simple geometry you could do erect a perpendicular to that line which is then obviously going to be north and south now the other thing is is you can do a north south line by going back to the the, the method that i said where you would have uh, two verticals and a horizontal and you hang a plumb, plumb bob. And then you have to have a back sight uh, of some kind set against the North Star. And, you know, because the North Star is not exactly at the North Celestial Pole, it's rotating around it a little bit. What you want to do is you want to sight against the North Star twice, 12 hours apart. Huh. And then split the difference. And now you've got a dead on north orientation. <laughs> <laughs> and see, this this would be really fun to yeah. me if we had a group of people and we were actually gonna build something using these techniques. You know, to take <laughs> take a group out onto a building site and lay out this template on the earth. And you know, in the in the philosophy of the old builders they believed that when you followed certain principles and practices and procedures that the structure you had built was like a living thing it was an organic so when the builders of the middle ages were building the high gothic cathedrals they were looking at those as as an organic living thing growing up out of the earth and each of the stones that went into the cathedral or into the temple were, were, were prepared and shaped according to certain philosophical principles. They were actually ceremoniously, um, you know, consecrated before their placing into the building, into the structure. And that was kind of the whole philosophy behind it. It wasn't just we're building a building. We're building a monument to the to the sacred nature of the universe, and we're building it according to these. We're we're, we're um, using these principles that are the principles that that the divine creative power of the universe is used to to create the world and the living things within it. In fact, in the old um, and we do this whenever we build a house. Uh, the old uh, Scandinavian builders, whenever they would build a church. In fact, you could probably even go online. I could pull up pictures here for some of our job. We haven't done one for a few years. But basically what you do is up on the ridge beam, the gable, uh, apex of the gable up on the ridge beam, you go and you cut a living bough, probably usually from an evergreen tree, and you attach it to the ridge beam of the building. And what that does is it, it's a symbol that the life power is coming up from the earth, flowing through the the, the timbers, flowing through the structures 
the 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 um, the beams and the girders and the and the the rafters and things, and the life force has now infused that building. Huh. Wow. So that's just kind of a different way of doing it, you know. Um, but it's it's it almost seems like the like imagining what you're saying, going out and 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 laying all this out, and then having a philosophy about how you're cutting the stone, all this stuff about the the Gothic cathedrals. It's like we build buildings today for other purposes. Like, well, we need we need a place to put all this stuff. It's called a mall, and we, people are going to come there and buy it, or a warehouse, or whatever. Yeah, but it almost seems like the purpose of those buildings was to build them. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. I'm going to show you. So let me, let me do a screen share here. You see that? Look at that. There. That's, that's actually in Australia, a recent topping out in Victoria. But yeah, this was a thing that they did of old and you know, the Scandinavians and that's kind of the building tradition that I come out of, you know, my dad was, his nickname used to be Swede Carlson, um, you know, because he was 100% Swede. My grandpa, his father was an immigrant from Sweden. And so they kind of had these traditions, um, you know, the Scandinavians. I don't know if it's Scandinavians here doing this in Australia, but I would say the idea was probably not limited to them. But but that's um, what you see here, the idea, the, the, the evergreen bough on, up, on the, up on the ridge uh, represents the fact that the life force is suffused. It's rising up from the earth, passing through the, the structural members of the building. See, and now you've, it's almost like you're saying that it's, it's blossoming out of the, out of the, uh, the apex or roof of the building. See, hmm. right. Yeah. So let's see here. Uh, it says here, the tree is an ancient construction tradition. There are many such rites associated with a new edifice, including the laying of foundation stones, the signing of beams and ribbon cuttings. Um, yeah, but what's particularly charming about the construction tree is that it isn't associated with the beginning or the end of construction. Rather, the tree is associated with the raising of a building's highest beam or structural element. Hence the name of the rite, the topping out ceremony. It is a sign that a construction project has reached its literal apogee, its most auspicious point. <laughs> That's really cool. That is cool, isn't it? OSHA would not allow this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do it. I mean, we do it whenever we have, you know, a building that we're topping out that we has a roof. We will do that. So, yeah, I've got pictures of our jobs going back 30 years ago where it's topped out with an evergreen bow. Wow. That's cool. Yep. Don't tell him. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't tell him. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> We're not going to tell him, folks. <laughs> so I, I wanted to ask you, and, and uh, you know, we look at, we spend a lot of time talking about the, um, some of the ancient construction uh, styles, like, you know, the Cyclopean style where every block is a different shape and size. Yeah. Do you think all of that has sacred geometry built into it as well, or are they doing that purely for structural reasons? I mean, have you looked at that? What's your opinion on that? Well, yeah, I, I, I would prefer not to proffer an opinion on that, having not studied it firsthand. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would, here's what I would guess. I would guess that there is a template there. Mm. Um, you know, the template can be rigorously formal or it can be very organic and everything in between because, you know, you're dealing with natural forces here. And so, you know, if you're building according to the, uh, say, let's say the patterns of underground water, you know, your, your temple is going to have a, a, a more organic feel to it. Yes. Okay. You know? So, so it, it can run the gamut, like I said, from, from formal, rigorously formal to, to, to very organic feeling. This is a really cool exercise here. You lay out the quartered circle on the ground and you get a chair and you put right at the intersection and then you sit there. In, this, in the Northern Hemisphere, we would look to the South. And then you sit there in that chair for one year. <laughs> I can do that. Hey, I can do that. Well, you, you would have, you know, Russ, you could do that. And then Kyle, yeah. you would bring him lunch every day. Yes. Um, yeah, and make sure he's fed while he's sitting there for his, <laughs> for his whole year. Just coffee. <laughs> just, just need coffee. I'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> 
No, you wouldn't. You uh, actually, Russ, you wouldn't have to sit there the whole time. You could get up and leave from a uh, time to time, but you'd want to come back. Right. So, w- what you're seeing here is that you'll see summer solstice. You're again, you're looking to the south. The line that would picture where this the line you've got a north south line, and then at right angles to that you've got an east west line. So. Look at that north-south line where it intersects the circle at south. Now picture a circle, an arc coming up in the z-axis that arcs over to the zenith and then down the other side. Okay, yeah. I okay, see. and so now the winter solstice sun, the equinoctial sun, and the summer solstice sun are all going to be aligned, arrayed on that line, which is the local meridian line, hmm. right? So this is your meridian here that you're – that you're seeing and the meridian line would extend from the, it would start by um, coming up from the horizon due South and then it would pass over the Zenith. Now what's the Zenith? The Zenith is the point in the sky that if you set up a plumb bob, right? One end of that plumb bob is pointing to the center of the earth, right? Right. The other line, if it was a vector, it would be pointing to the, apex of the of the celestial dome which is the zenith okay. now the zenith is a local phenomena so my zenith right now in georgia is not the same as your zenith in texas right you're looking you would be looking at a different point in space than i would but relatively speaking it would be the point directly overhead so if you can picture this line coming up from the from the horizon due south passing over your zenith and then arcing down and 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 touching the horizon at due north, everything is measured off your local meridian, right, east and west. And so you've got your hour lines, which are each 15 degrees, measured left and right of that, you see. Now what they've done for, the geographers have done, is they have lined up the local meridian with the Greenwich meridian. Okay, right. See, so now they've kind of standardized the system. So if you really wanted to get the full effect, you would need to go sit in Greenwich, England and with your chair. <laughs> um, I'm down. That's you're down, man. Far. Too I far for me to bring coffee. To yeah, man, let's do it. We need a field trip here. They'll, they'll probably be wondering what we're doing there. Um, <laughs> Why has that guy been sitting in that chair for like eight months? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking we could probably get a, a, you know, a sofa. Yeah. Put there. Because, you know, you might want to take naps and stuff. Yeah, give me a nice recliner. I'll be cool. It'll be yeah. great. <laughs> so, so, okay. So now looking at this, you can see the summer solstice, the sun's way up much higher in the sky than it is at the equinoxes and the winter solstice. Now, there are one winter solstice per annual cycle, one summer solstice, and two equinoxes. So you'll also notice that if you follow the path, uh, coming up from the east for the summer solstice arc, that yellow line comes up, passes through at high noon. It's going to be due south, right? And then it's going to arc around and it's going to set in the west. Now notice winter solstice. It's basically doing the same thing, but notice how much shorter the path is. Right. Right. So right there, graphically, you can see why summer solstice daytime is much longer than winter solstice daytime. Right. It's uh, the the, cir- the circle that the sun is describing. There's much more of it above the plane of the ground there. Yes. And then, of course, at equinoxes, they're going to be precisely the same. Right. Now, equinox, you know, most people think equinox, oh, today is the day of the equinox. But really, it's not a, a full day. It's just a moment. It's a, a mere moment in time that has actually no duration at all. It's, it's simply <laughs> a moment, right? <laughs> but obviously for the real world, you know, I always say, well, narrow it down to a second or two, because that would be, you could actually, you could realistically measure the equinox to within a couple of seconds of the actual moment. But, you know, it's kind of like Zeno's paradox. It's kind of like fractals. If, if you took that one second and microscopically zoomed in on it, yeah. you see that the, that the moment of equinox is just an infinitesimally small part of that. Right. See? 
But we don't need to go there because we're, you know, we're living in a three-dimensional real world of time and space. So if we can get it within a couple of seconds, hey, we're good, okay? Right. Uh, but those couple of seconds are actually, are they going to be at noon or are they going to be at sunrise? Well, it depends because, no, it, it, well, that would all depend on where you are. And see, you, what would you have ah. to do is find the exact point on Earth oh. to be. For example, if you if you wanted that moment to be exactly due south, you need to be at the right place. And I've figured that out. I don't remember exactly where it is. But, you know, that point moves. So if, if you were setting your chair up to look at the e moment of equinox, um, when it crosses the, the local meridian on the, the, the on this to the south the next me. the next year you would have to move your chair a little bit <laughs> actually <laughs> that is if you were going to sit there for multiple years now if you wanted to sit there for an entire lifetime you could get a good sense of the processional motion okay so kyle and i kyle and i set up a we we did a on the equinox we set up a transit and right at dawn we sighted the transit in and we decided that that was the east that was the east west line and that's wrong basically it's not it's not quite accurate is that what that's what you're saying yeah what did you what did you cite on so, you so on on the equinox we set up a transit and when the sun came up over the horizon right when it touched the horizon on the equinox we cited the transit right at it and we drew that as our east west line and you're saying that we're that's going to be a little bit off it's going to be a little bit off yeah Damn. it is going to be a little bit off because see you were on the day, see, see, so you were there and did it at sunrise, right? But the moment of equinox didn't necessarily coincide with your local sunrise, right? Yeah. Dang see, it. I was baffled because I came back at sunset, and all I had to do was flip the transit over to point the other direction. It's just a simple, just flipping the 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 sightings, the yep. swinging open. around 180 degrees, yeah. and the sun's setting, and it's not in line. <laughs> And I was like, what's the deal? <laughs> but now I think I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that would have been pretty disconcerting. Yeah. yeah. We were like, what's we, wrong with the universe? <laughs> what's wrong with the universe? The universe is effed up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that partly explains it. Also, the fact that, you know, undoubtedly you weren't on a, you would, in order to do this with a high degree of accuracy, you'd have to be on an absolutely dead level plane. Right. Which that was what, that was the, that was the idea that I, I basically blamed it on the fact that the, or the, the possibility that the elevation over there where the sun rose was, was different. different from the elevation where, where I saw setting. it setting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, that I'm sure that was probably the major part of it actually. Okay. And you know, it's amazing that even, you know, when ground, you know, the land looks level, it may not be level at all. So now I want to go out there to our site where we did this thing with the transit and try your sun pole shadow trick and see how off our east west line is. <laughs> well, and here and here's the thing: your your east west line is going to be a little bit off too. Oh, and, 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 yeah, because you see, here's the thing: in in the in the say the eight hours or ten nine hours, ten hours, whatever it is, and it. You know, it's going to be depending on what time of year you do it too. But the span of time between those two, remember the earth has now been moving oh, um, yeah. eight, 18 miles per second <laughs> around the sun. So that's yeah. going to throw you off because now the earth is going to be, you know, let's say you do eight hours. Well, eight times 3,600 times 18, the, sun, the earth has now moved over half a million miles right in those eight hours <laughs> well how do the ancients do all these how do they get it all so precise like that the great pyramid is so freaking precise on the cardinal points they must have well you, you 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 would just have to do you would have to um make multiple observations and then interpolate uh, okay yeah. that, that's how you would do it have to do it a lot yeah yeah you would do it more than once and and you know like the 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 method I was describing for the um, for finding the north axis you can you can get that pretty damn close if you can picture what I'm saying basically again imagine that you've got this um, looks something that looks like a goalpost and and the horizontal bar you've got a plumb bob hanging from there and then you use that 
and then you sight against the North Star, right? Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now you get a, a foresight in front of it. So you've got three points, the observation point, the, the plumb line, and the North Star. And you, set, you get that exact line. You put a stake in the ground there. Now, 12 hours later, the, the North Star is going to have gone through half of its circuit around the exact celestial North Pole, right? So yeah. you take a second sighting, put a second stake in the ground, and now what you do is you split the difference between those two. Because right. one stake represents a line tangent to one side of the arc. The other stake represents a tangent line to the other side of the arc. Right. So you'd, so have to do this, you'd have to do this near the winter solstice when you have more than 12 hours of darkness so that you can see the North Star over a long period of time. Well, actually, what you would want is as close to 12 hours as you could get. Right. I'm just because saying, you need, you, so that means you need 12 hours of darkness, which means you need a yes, long night. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. That would be exactly right. Man, that's cool. <laughs> we need to try both of those up on our Hill Hinge project. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and so, so it'd be interesting. Now, I have never done, I've never done the North Star thing. Um, but you could certainly, it wouldn't be hard to do. I yeah. Mean, it, it conceptually it's it's pretty straightforward um and it's just a matter of of a little bit of trial and error to get your ideal uh sighting positions and so on right um, and then make sure you have a night that's where you're no clouds move in and obscure right. you. <laughs> yes right. exactly well thanks man we're gonna have to go rip up our hill hinge project yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've been building this giant hill hinge project based on our faulty freaking measurements of the east west line and now we're gonna have to start over <laughs> well well but we want future archaeologists to think we knew what we were doing so we need to do this right <laughs> yeah even if you don't know what you're doing you want to try to give the impression that right you're... yeah we definitely need to right. give them the impression that we freaking knew what we were doing yeah and that we had lasers they need to try to you know they need to try to figure out how they did this without lasers so <laughs> yeah well yeah we can do lasers now we have technology so we don't need to use the, but it's it's fun to do the old techniques right um and really you can you can refine those techniques and get them to be extremely accurate that's kind of the idea there man well i think uh we we got a lot of snake bros, snake force people out there. I, I would encourage anybody out there to try these these techniques. I mean, that the, especially the one with the pole in the ground in the shadow. That sounds fun and it's pretty easy. Yeah, when you're when you're laying out your garden, yeah, you know, just just do that first, and right. then you can, um, I don't know, a temple garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make it make it you know fit the the shape of the universe and at least point in the right direction. Well, Randall, this has been fantastic, man. Thank you so much for coming on for episode 108. 